Beginning with the slides on page 104, I want to go through an example of a distillation in which the separation of cyclohexane and toluene is accomplished by distillation. So here is the apparatus, there are the chemicals. Benzene is the low boiling component, and toluene is the high boiling component. The flask has a one-to-one -one mixture of benzene and toluene. And what I would like to be able to know is to predict what the boiling point of this mixture is, and also what's going to distill from this one-to-one -one mixture. This is done with a phase diagram, specifically a two-component phase diagram. You'll see along the x-axis that you have both components in the mixture. On the left side is pure benzene, and the amount of benzene decreases along the x-axis as you go to the right. At the right, you have 100% toluene, and as you proceed to the left, the amount of toluene decreases. So every mixture of benzene and toluene is represented along the x-axis. Then along the y-axis, we have temperature, and that line called the liquid line is actually the boiling point of any mixture in this two-component mixture. And so if you have a one-to-one -one mixture of benzene and toluene, you find that on the x-axis, follow that up to the liquid line, and then read the boiling point from the y-axis. And that's about 92 degrees. I also want to be able to predict what's going to distill. So what is that vapor in equilibrium with the liquid? For that, this additional line is on the graph, and it's labeled vapor line, but it means the composition of the vapor in equilibrium with that liquid at a particular temperature. So before, where we followed this over and found the boiling point of 92, at 92, the composition of the vapor is given by the vapor line. And you can see that that is about 75 percent benzene. So this is how we can describe the first drops that come off during a distillation. And now a little digression. These slides aren't in the lab manual, but I want you to know where these graphs come from. First, they can be derived or calculated, or they can be created from experimental data. Here is what that experiment looks like. First, you'd prepare a 50-50 mixture, and then measure its boiling point. This is exactly as you did in lab, measuring the boiling point by refluxing in a test tube, and you measure the temperature. So that's good. You plot that point. You measured it at 92 degrees boiling. So it's plotted up here on the graph. Here's a bit of an enlargement of that boiling liquid in equilibrium of the refluxing vapor. So what we need to do now is know what the composition of that vapor is. Grab a syringe, draw some of that gas out, and then inject it into a GC, and analyze the two components. Now you know at 92 degrees what the ratio of the two components are. And so you would plot that on the graph. The next step is to get eight friends together, have them make different mixtures, and repeat this exact experiment. Once they've done that, you'll get a whole bunch of points on the graph, which you can see you then can uh, connect with a smooth line. So that's how we do an experiment to determine the liquid line and the vapor line. This information, as I mentioned, can also be derived or calculated. Here's what that calculation looks like. First, we've already seen Rayout's law in this lecture, and Rayout's law says that when you have a mixture of liquids, the pressure exerted by a component of that liquid is simply the vapor pressure of the pure component times its mole fraction. I think it's useful to look at this as a graph. So on this graph, again, it's a two-component mixture along the x-axis. 
in the x-axis describes all mixtures of benzene and toluene. And then on the y-axis, you have pressure. So the pure vapor pressure of component A is shown here. And then Rael's law says that it decreases as the mole fraction de increase, decreases. Sorry. The pressure of per, pure component B, pure toluene, is shown here. If you'll notice, the vapor pressure is lower because it's higher boiling. And again, if it follows Rayalt's law, then that pressure decreases. Bring into the whole mess what Dalton said. Dalton's law of partial pressure says that the total pressure is simply the sum of those individual pressures. And you get the green line now drawn on the graph. This shows the vapor pressure of all these mixtures of benzene and toluene. This is all well and good, but during a distillation, I can't measure vapor pressure. I've got a thermometer. I can only measure temperature. So we need a relationship between vapor pressure and temperature. And again, reaching back to general chemistry, that's Clausius and Clapeyron. They came up with this relationship that says that if you know one vapor pressure at a particular temperature, you can predict a new vapor pressure at a new temperature. This requires a couple of constants, the universal gas constant, and also the enthalpy of vaporization. So that can be looked up in a table, as well as the temperature and pressure at under standard conditions of that liquid. So the next step is to solve for the new pressure you want, plug that back into this equation, and then you have to do that twice, once for benzene and the other time for toluene. Once you substitute this in and then solve for the mole fraction, you get an equation that looks like this. Yikes, looks like a mess. But look what you've got. This equation gives you mole fraction as a function of temperature. Temperature, temperature. Everything else in this equation is a constant the atmospheric pressure, the vapor pressure of pure components, the enthalpy of vaporization of pure components, and the temperature that that vapor pressure was measured at. So all constants. And that's why I wanted to look at this graphically, because that equation is, is kind of hairy. When you plot that equation, you get something familiar. That is that liquid line from the earlier graph. If you make one more ideal gas law substitution, you can get the vapor line also from theory. All right, in fractional distillation, operationally it's a lot like simple, except you put a fractionating column in between the boiling flask and the distillation head or the condenser. Let's use this graphical model to see what happens during a fractional distillation. Again in the flask is a one-to-one -one mixture of benzene. And as you've already seen, when that boils, it's going to produce a 75%, a mixture of vapors that is 75% pure benzene. So this liquid boils, the vapors travel up, and they're 75% benzene. But then this column is a little cooler, and so the vapors condense and begin to roll back down. So this 75% pure benzene liquefies and is rolling back down. It meets hot vapors coming up, and it boils again. When 75% pure benzene boils, follow this up and over and down, and what you get is 90% pure benzene. So again, the 75% benzene boils and gives you vapors that are 90% pure. This can happen again. Those vapors cool and condense and begin to roll back down. On the way, they meet hot vapors on the way up, and they boil. If you're boiling 90% pure benzene, it'll boil at a much lower temperature and give you vapors 
that are 97% pure. So again, these, this 90% pure benzene boils, the vapors are 97% pure, and these are the vapors that cool, condense, and you ultimately collect. This explains fractional distillation, how you can get such greater enrichment than in a simple distillation. When you've got a column that gives the result you see like this, that is two cycles of enrichment beyond a simple distillation, we say that that column has two theoretical plates. So when I start with 50% benzene and get 97% benzene, I know that that column has two theoretical plates because it's two cycles of enrichment, one, two, beyond the kind of enrichment I get in a simple distillation. So far, I've talked about distillation as just a moment in time. The first moment, as a matter of fact. But remember what happens. We are distilling away benzene, the low boiling component, at a greater rate. So the flask, after some distills, is no longer 50% benzene. And the composition of that flask changes. I like to think of distillation in my mind as a movie. I'm running frames, and in each frame, the composition of the pot changes, enriching more and more in the high boiling material. For fractional distillation, you need a lot of material to distill. Uh, with very specialized equipment, you can distill as little as, say, five mils. It's much easier, as you're doing today in lab, on a large scale.